Hey everyone, thanks for being with us today as we continue our study in the book of Joshua. Before we get into it, I have asked Nancy Zellerhoff if she would be willing to open us up in prayer. Jim and Nancy have been longtime important people at New Day, and they are a regular faithful part of our Zoom prayer huddle on Sunday mornings. And so it's a privilege to have Nancy be the one to open us up today. And so would you join with her as she leads us to the Lord in prayer? Good morning, New Day family. Um, Sunday blessings to all of you. Uh, my name is Nancy Zellerhoff and it seems like, you know, it's been almost a year since we've seen each other. And especially then when you put that mask on your face and you say, who is that? But um, I'm here this morning to pray with all of you. And um, I took our prayer from Psalm 62. There were some um, promises and uh, spoke of who, who, who our Lord is. And um, so in Psalm 62, uh, we say, we praise you, Lord, for who you are. You, Lord, are a rock under our feet. You are our refuge and you are our fortress and that can't be shaken. Our soul finds rest in you, Lord, and our hope comes from you, Father. We praise you for you are trustworthy. We can pour our hearts out to you we get our strength from you, and your love is unfailing. So this morning, Father, we lift up our New Day congregation. Uh, we ask, Lord, for your direction as we carve out a new path for our church. Um, we lift up Jeff and ask that he can be filled with the Holy Spirit, that it will be your words, um, Father, that he speaks to all of us. We ask that our hearts and our minds can be open to receive what you have for us today. And we ask, Lord, that you will fill our hearts with joy um, and not just fill our hearts, Lord, but to fill us with overflowing of your joy, Father. And by that, they will know that we are Christians by our love. So we say thank you, Lord, and amen. I don't know if you could actually call this a talent, but Karin and I seem to have developed a knack for picking TV shows to watch that end the season in a cliffhanger and then get canceled. It's really annoying. We'll get all invested in these characters who are apparently not all that interesting because not enough people are watching the show. Uh, we'll get all invested in them and then not be able to find out what happened to them. Or I guess what actually didn't happen to them because nothing else was ever written about them. So somehow we, we muddle through and manage to find uh, the next show to watch. But last week, we, we talked about how the Israelites were at this cliffhanger where they were just about ready to cross the Jordan into the Promised Land, and we, we left them there. Well, we're going to leave them there again this week. If you're just dying to know what happens next for them, you'll have to read the story for yourself or just wait till our next installment. Uh, but it felt important to me to pause in this story and actually step out of the book of Joshua to look at a bit of history leading up to this story. Winston Churchill once said that the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you're likely to see. We're not just reading this story of the Israelites as historic events. We are looking at their journey and holding it up next to our own journey and figuring out what translates? What can we take from their experience to help us in our own? And so much of what we're trying to do right now is to look as far forward as we can. We're trying to understand 
Where is it that God is taking us as a church and as individual Christians? And if it can be helpful in that effort to look backward, then let's do it. Let's take full advantage of all that is at our disposal in God's word so that we can uh, have as great a perspective and understanding as possible as, as we look ahead. And where I'd like to go with you today is actually to the book of Exodus, some 40 years plus uh, before this event. Moses has gone up Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments from God. And while he is up there, God speaks to him about what it's going to be like for Israel when they get to this point, when they're crossing into the Promised Land. But he's not just talking to Moses, because Joshua has also gone with him up on the mountain. And so Joshua is hearing all this. It's, it's really like God is, is speaking to Moses, but he's really speaking to Joshua, because it's Joshua who's going to be the one to go through this. And so now, all these years later, this conversation with God would be in the back of Joshua's mind as he's about to lead the people into the land. So let's take a look at it. It's, it's in Exodus chapter 23, starting in verse 27. God says, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all of your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year, because the land would become desolate, and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little I will drive them out before you, until you have increased enough to take possession of the land." It might feel like too big of a jump to go from the experience of the Israelites to your own life, like we're just stretching things too far there. I think we have all kinds of freedom to make connections. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he told his disciples that the entire Old Testament, both the law and the prophets, all pointed to him. So when we talk about Israel going in and claiming the promised land, we can see that Jesus himself is our promised land. Scripture says as much in 1 Corinthians. It says that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. They're yes in Christ. In other words, all of God's promises find their fulfillment in Him. So when God invites us to step across the river, to, to step out in trust and hope in Jesus and what He's done for us, that is where we are going to begin to experience all the goodness God has for us because it is Christ Himself who contains all of God's promises. So, when we come to a passage like the one we read today, uh, how do we relate to that? How does that um, connect to us? Well, let's summarize what we read. First, we can see that God really does want his people to experience the promised land. He had made that promise to Abram hundreds of years before, and it is going to happen. It's not a matter of if, but when. Secondly, we see that God himself is the primary actor making it happen. It's not going to be Israel who's going to accomplish this. God is going to be the one to drive out all these other nations. And then thirdly, and this is maybe the most interesting point for our discussion today, is that God says he's not going to do this immediately, but he's going to do it, what? Little by little. Little by little. So, imagine being the Israelites poised on the edge of the Jordan River, and let's say you don't know this little piece of information about how God is going to go about this. And so you're, you're anticipating getting there. You've dreamed about this place. You've heard so much about it. It's been built way up, so expectations are high. You cross over the river. You set up camp. And you know that God has promised you this place. So your expectation is that you are just going to settle down and enjoy it. And then you look around and you see that you're not the only ones there. There are all these enemy nations still in the land, and each one is going to need to be dealt with individually. And that's going to take time, and it's going to take struggle, and it's going to take pain. It's going to be a long time before you can just enjoy the land. In fact, we'll get down to the end of the book of Joshua and find the people are still fighting battles. 
well, this is one of the most difficult things for me about the Christian faith is to go, it's not immediate, but it is a little by little struggle. We've said that our mission as a church is to live out of being loved by God. And we know that that promise of his love is solid and secure. It's not something we have to earn. It is there for us. That is in place. It's concrete. And we said that when we have that, our responses are going to be that we're going to love God back. We're going to love ourselves well, and we're going to love each other freely. That is the natural outflow of that condition of living out of being loved by God. And yet, doing that, being in that place, we find that all these other things, all these other enemies interfere with that desire to live that way. There are still all kinds of fears around us, all kinds of history, all kinds of sin, all kinds of pain that we are left grappling with. And we wonder how come, if this is how God wants us to live, how come these other things are still in the land? You know, we've talked a lot over the last year about the topic of racism. I had a chance this week to talk with Thomas Anderson Jr., who is the pastor of Shiloh Hills Fellowship in Spokane. They're a sister church to New Day, part of the same Converge family of churches. And uh, he had some really interesting things to say about this idea of the, the time the process takes. And I wanted to just share a brief little clip of his words. 1619 to 2021 is 402 years. Okay? Let's mm -hmm. make it even. I like even numbers. 400 years. <laughs> I mean, not just get rid of two. 246 of those years, so more than half, slavery. That means less than half the time the country has been around, slavery was common. When there wasn't slavery, there was Jim Crow. Legalized right. segregation, right? My dad has stories as a kid knowing he could not use the same bathroom as white people. Mm. That's how close this is, by the way. My dad's only in his 60s. So what I'm trying to say is that for easily 300, 300 plus of the 400 years, you got a history of trauma. It could be utopia right now, which it isn't. It's a broken and fallen world. It doesn't mean the trauma's gone. It doesn't mean a group of people have been helped through and worked through it. It doesn't, which means by the way, if I'm looking at 300 years of a organized system designed to oppress people, that doesn't change overnight. Right? Right. When's the last time a person changed overnight, let alone an entire society that doesn't change over just a, a decade or a century even. It was a really compelling conversation. If you want to hear more of it, you can just go out to our new Reconciliation Resources page on our website. It's newdaynw.com. Just go to the home page, scroll to the bottom, you'll see a button with a link to it, and then go to the video section. But back to this idea of God working little by little. This, for me personally, is one of the hardest areas to wrap my brain around in my walk with God. Because as I think about it, I go, well, if God wants me to be complete, if he wants me to be mature and holy, and if he wants me to experience all the fullness of these promises, and if I'm not, if I'm not there yet, then that feels to me like I'm somehow in the wrong, like I am outside of God's will or I'm sinning or something because it can't be right if only the finished ideal is right. And so that doesn't leave me very much room for process. It doesn't leave me with very much grace for myself or for other people because I'll look at them and go, well, they're not there yet. And, and it can call into question God's goodness and his power, because if he can't make his own will happen, then what does that mean? And then I can just get cynical and, and jaded around everything because nothing seems to be working or effective. 
Or I can go the other way and say, no, these things really are true and all I have to do is believe harder and, and then uh, I, can, I can live in victory in some way. And so I, I can get very small in my faith when I don't allow for that to be true. But if instead I can do what we talked about last week, which is to welcome reality, welcome this reality that God does not work immediately and that that is part of his plan, what would that change? How does that make things different? What kind of new freedoms does that open up? Well, we can wonder why would God work that way? If this is what he wants, why would he take so much time to make it happen? I think this passage that we looked at gives us some clues and some hints to follow. First off, I think it says to us that there is grace even in the battle when it reveals more of God to us. There's grace in the battle when it reveals more of God to us. God told Moses he was sending his terror ahead of the people to drive out the nations. Earlier he had said he was sending his angel ahead of them. And we find that every time Israel went out to war, they took the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them. It was God leading the way into battle. And so often when we think of our own struggles, we can feel like we are all alone in it. When in reality, God is the tip of the spear. He is out in front of us. He is fighting our battles on our behalf. And so often the reason we don't recognize him is because God is so creative in the ways that he goes about it that we wouldn't even dream that that's the way he's fighting on our behalf. You notice in that passage that he said that he was sending the hornet? That's kind of strange. Scholars have wondered about that. Was God talking about actual hornets, some kind of swarm that was going out with the army? Uh, or was this just metaphorical and kind of referring to the type of fear people would experience? I don't know if it really matters. The, the point is that God is so creative in the way he expresses things and the way he goes about things. You know, this is the God who made the wheels fall off of Pharaoh's chariots and the God who brought the walls of Jericho down with a shout and who set ambushes against the enemy through worship. Uh, this is the God who caused one army to fight against themselves and another army to go blind, who shook the ground and caused the Moabites to go into a panic, who sent a boy out to fight a giant, and who surrounded Elisha in the hills with chariots of fire, and then who sent his own son as a baby to conquer sin and death. God is so creative in the way he fights. One of my favorite stories is about Karin's great aunt Ruby, uh, who was a missionary to India for a long time. And then she had to leave the country and go back to Canada. And while she was there, she, she got her master's degree. And so she was really ready and, and willing to go back to the mission field, either back to India or to Africa. But at every turn, doors kept closing and it was so frustrating to her because she felt like here she was trying to do something for God and she felt like he was just putting her on the shelf. Every turn seemed to be blocked. She was in this major struggle and she felt alone in it. Well, many, many years later, she found out that that exact amount of time that she had been back in Canada enabled her to qualify for Canada's version of social security, that that was going to be her retirement income. God was providing for her in the most creative of ways and she couldn't see it. This is what some of our struggles and our battles reveal to us is that God is right there with us and there is much that we can look for and see him in uh, to give him glory in the midst of it. So that's one thing that God can be revealed in the midst of the battles. The other thing I think is that there's grace in the battle when there are enemies that I can't see. There's grace in the battle when there are enemies that I can't see. God told Moses and Joshua that part of the reason why he was not driving out the nations all at once was because if he did that, then the land would become desolate and the wild animal population would take over. And then they'd have a whole different problem on their hands. 
So as counterintuitive as it seems, God was saying, I'm going to allow these struggles, these very fierce struggles that you're engaged in, to go ahead and play out because they're sparing you from a different kind of problem. And Israel would never even see what that might have looked like because God protected them from that, even as he allowed these other fights to continue. And I wonder how many times in our own lives, as we're engaged with something that's really difficult, how many times is God letting that be there to protect us from the wild animals that we can't even see? Peter talks about that when he says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's just out there waiting for us, waiting for that opportunity. And God, in his great sovereign mercy, is preventing that from happen, happening sometimes in the form of allowing us to take place in a different kind of struggle. I think about Paul's story and his, his thorn in the flesh. You know, he had been given these incredible visions. He had seen stuff about God that hardly anybody ever gets to see. And he felt like God allowed this struggle in his life, this thorn, to be there to prevent him from going to pride over it, to thinking he was something special for having these visions. And who knows what that pride might have done to wreck and interfere with his mission in the world. So God allowed this other struggle to continue. I remember reading one time, author Chuck Olson said something about denominations. You know, so often we decry the division within the church. How can there be so many different variations when we're supposed to be one? And he, he made the interesting point that maybe God was sparing us through all this division because if the church were all totally united, that it would become triumphalistic and be unbearable in the world. And this was a point of humility for us. Well, there are so many ways where I look at my own life and I go, I wonder if that particular battle is somehow a way that God is sparing me from something else. It changes the way that we, that we fight against our fights when we begin to think that maybe God is using this uh, in a way for my protection. So, uh, the, there can be grace in the battle when there are enemies that I can't see. There's also grace in the battle when it gives me room to grow. When it gives me room to grow. Part of why the wild animals pose such a threat was because Israel was so small as a nation. They, they weren't big enough to occupy all the land that God was giving them. And so, God slowed down the process to keep pace with their growth. And as they expanded, they could also take over more territory. So it became this real mercy for them, the way he handled that process. I think, I think he does that for us too. How many times have you prayed and asked God for something and he hasn't given it to you at the time and you've been really disappointed? And then later on, he did answer that prayer. You did get it. And you could look back and go, oh, I thought I was so ready then, and I really wasn't. I can see why he waited for that. God knows what we can handle, when we can handle it, and he allows the struggle to continue until we are ready. And sometimes it's the struggle itself that is producing that growth within us. We tend to grow the most through times of difficulty and hardship. You might be surprised to know that after the Bible, the book Pilgrim's Progress is the all-time best-selling book ever in history. It uh, started printing in 1678, and it hasn't been out of print ever since. Just phenomenally popular. Well, the author John Bunyan uh, had a really difficult, arduous mental, spiritual life. He struggled with OCD for at least 10 years of his life, and progress and healing was painfully, agonizingly slow. God's little by little process in him was very difficult for him. But he wrote this autobiography, and at the end of it, I just want to read his words to you because I think they are encouraging for us. He said, I find to this day 
Seven things I hate in my heart. One, a tendency to not believe. Two, suddenly forgetting the love and mercy Christ has shown. Three, a leaning toward works of the law. Four, wanderings and coldness in prayer. Five, to forget to watch for what I've prayed for. Six, complaining about what I don't have while not enjoying what I do. Seven, I can't seem to do anything God tells me to without my sin jumping into the picture when I would do good, evil is present with me. And then he says this, he says, I'm continually afflicted with these things, yet God works them for my good. They keep me from trusting my own heart. They convince me that none of my internal goodness will ever be good enough. They show me the need to fly to Jesus. They drive me to prayer. They show me the need to watch for him. They make me look to God and for Christ to carry me through this world. I love it how he was able to see that God was growing him up through all his battles and that he could interpret all of it as grace. And I wonder about that for myself and for you. I don't know what the struggles are that you're facing today, carrying with you. I've no doubt that they're challenging and I'm certainly not saying that you need to like them. I'm not even saying that, that God planned them for you. Maybe they're the result of, of great evil. And yet, God can take all of it, all the struggles we find ourselves in, he can take them and use them for our good. And he does. And he goes at a pace that he knows we can actually handle. And that's true not just for each one of us, but also for all of us collectively. I know that this is a really hard time to be New Day. We all ache and long for getting into that new season, wondering what is it, God, that you have next for us. And yet, as I think about it and reflect on it, I have to wonder, is there a reason God has us in this place right now, this particular struggle, this slow spot? Could it be that there is essential growth that needs to happen for us in order for us to get ready for the next thing he has? Do we need to be right here, right now, and paying attention to what's going on right now? Is he in some way protecting us from an enemy that we can't see? Is there more of himself that he wants to reveal to us? I don't want to be so caught up in my own anxieties, my own frustrations and impatience and grumbling and feeling like this all feels wrong right now. I don't want to be so stuck in that attitude towards it that I can't receive what he has for us in it. Can we be aware and paying attention that something is going on, that he is using all of this, that this is how God works? This is how God works. Can we be looking for that? There's a little book called Three Mile an Hour God. It was written by Kosuke Koyama. And he chose that title because that's a pace that human beings walk at. We walk at three miles an hour and he says, God walks right at our pace. And he said this in his book. He said, God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would have gone much faster. He would have gone much faster. Can we all, and I include myself in this, can we all learn to see his little by little pacing as reflecting his love and not just something that's getting in our way or holding us back or interfering with our progress? Can we see that, that his will is as much about the process as it is about the end destination? and that it's possible to experience so much more grace along the way. God, that's what we want. We want, to, we want to not miss out on what you're doing. In our rush, in our sense of needing to get beyond the moment, um, would you slow us back down and, and help us to instead 
uh, be more aware of how much you have to offer us here. I ask that for myself, I ask that for each person, and I ask it for us as a church. Um, Lord, this is a rich season as much as it's a frustrating one. Help us take every advantage of it for knowing you better and becoming more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.